uh, we're excited to connect with you to go on a little adventure uh, into some of the biodiversity of a place that you get to explore. Maybe we'll even call it your backyard uh, oh, yes. and that you get to explore, you're very familiar with. Um, first of all, how's your day going? It's really good. I mean, we are six hours ahead of you guys. So my day is, well, I would say good morning to you, but it's- uh, You are well into your day. It's morning for me, but you're well into your day. Yeah, and it's doing good. We've been dancing around eating cheese doodles and singing to myself this morning. Oh, that sounds amazing. Mm-hmm. Are we gonna get a little bit of that in the event today? No. Nope. No? Okay, fair nope. enough. <laughs> there. Well, Pia, it's so great to have you joining us live uh, from Norway today. Um, for those tuning in may not know, you're a marine biologist, you're the co-founder and academic leader of Passion for Ocean, and you're also the co-founder of Rent a Biologist. And we've been able to steal your time a little bit in the last few weeks to share some of your adventures and some of the work that you do. Can you tell us just a little bit about Rent a Biologist? Sounds pretty cool. Yeah, um, it was. It started out as a, a need to take the load off because I got so many questions, you know, if I could take people down into the littoral zone and pick up seaweed and poke around with crabs and everything like that and just, you know, go explore. And I know so many amazing biologists. I've been, you know, traveling all over Norway, meeting so many great people and I have so many great friends in this area. So I just wanted to round them up, introduce them to each other and have them, you know, exchange knowledge and experience. And then after a little while, this got so fundamental that we basically said, you know what, let's just rent you guys out. So it's basically and sort of like an agency for biologists who like to talk like myself. There we go. Yeah. Super cool. Uh, so you've got a little uh, bit of biodiversity to show us. You're going to take us deep into the kelp forest, cold, beautiful waters. We're excited to dive in. Uh, when you're ready, let's go. Okay, great. Well, I am definitely, I'm, every, everything is relevant. So when I say deep, I mean, maybe 10 meters down, which would be 30 something feet for you guys. Um, but yeah, I'm going to take you into my backyard and show you where I live, sort of. So um, do you see the screen now? Yeah, great. We are good. Okay. Yeah, good. So, um, yeah, as you said, I'm a marine biologist. I uh, sort of uh, specialize in answering questions you didn't really know you had, uh, and then some. So my take on this whole conservation thing is through curiosity and experience. So I have a billion different sort of useless facts about nature. Um, For example, this little picnic going in here is so skinny that it has to squeeze its intestines out into its legs which is kind of cool, if you ask me. Um, and this is this has been the main drive for founding Passion for Ocean. So Passion for Ocean um, sort of came into being about five years ago when I met an uh, organization psychologist named Rebecca. And we both had the same vision on how we wanted to do conservation work. So there are a lot of amazing people talking about all the issues and all the solutions out there, which are so important, but we tend to forget about the thing in between, which is the why, you know, why do we do what we do? Why do, why should I care? Why should I change my entire life? Because some picnogonid with skinny legs don't really wanna, you know, go extinct. So Passion for Ocean is founded on this whole curiosity uh, and love for the ocean. So we all solely believe that you protect what you love, which is you know, an expression that I, pretty, I think most people are familiar with and could get behind. Um, and the speaker before me, she, she tapped into that as well. You need to have the community with you. You need to have the people with you. You can't really talk too much to people and tell them, you know, point fingers, tell them what to do. You have to have them have that inner motivation, that drive to want to change uh, if we want to fix the world. And one of the things that I really like to talk about are all the cool, weird things in the ocean, not necessarily the ones who give us the most money or are the most important you know, aspects of the ecosystem, but stuff like this one. This is the Velvet Belly Lantern Shark, and those green dots are not photoshopped in. They are lanterns, so we have a bioluminescent shark in Norway, 
but in, in the world in general. And if that is not the coolest thing you have heard in your entire life, then I really don't know what's wrong with you because this is awesome. <laughs> and just imagine swimming down to 40 meters, turning off your lights and then seeing a little green shark swimming towards you, just like Avatar, it's crazy. But I promised you a trip to the kelp forest. So I figure let's start at the beginning in the littoral zone. And what you see here is, I mean, just in this picture alone, you have four different species. You have the finger kelp, you have the wing kelp, you have the spaghetti seaweed, and you have the coralinas. And the top three here are delicious. I mean, go out there in the springtime and pick these guys and, you, and eat them, and they are tasty as a word that I'm not allowed to say. Uh, but other than that, I mean, look at the colors. Now, most people think that the Arctic and the you know North Atlantic and the colder waters are just gray and dull, and brown, sort of boring. No, no, there are so many colors here. You don't have to go down to the tropics to experience just this iridescent firework of colors, just poking down your head into the kelp or in the seaweed in general, and you will see this. These are one of the most common anemones that we have, but most people ignore them because they don't really look. So that's one of the things that I really want to help you with, just opening your eyes and actually looking when you're in the water. And again, all this pink, this is, I don't know how to pronounce it, myrrh, maybe? Um, but this is uh, something that looks like coral, but is actually an algae. So it's this crust forming pink algae that you can see everywhere. And you know, with that in mind, if you just move aside all the kelp, well, let's go diving in. Now the first thing you'll see when you poke your head underneath the surface is this, which is just slowing my heartbeat down at least 20 beats a minute because it's so calming and nice and soothing. And if you go even deeper, this is what you see. Now, when you go deep into the kelp forest, you are, you've been met with this breathtaking experience. Like this, this is, a, this is a dimension and just a universe that is like nothing else. Now I'm a really big fan of sci-fi and you know fantasy, and I'm not sure if that's why I like the ocean as much or if it's the, the other way around, but this is science, fi science fiction and fantasy in real life. So yeah, I like to look at, um, evolution has a little big, you know, a little fat man called Frank. And I think Frank took a lot of LSD when he created the ocean because in here are so many weird colors and shapes and functions. And you can see on the side here is all that pink stuff that we looked at earlier. And the kelp forest here is not only colorful, it is also the home of thousands of species. Now this one protects our shorelines from erosion, it captures a massive amount of energy from the ocean, you know, the big ocean. It also captures and harbor, harbors uh, lots and lots and lots of little larvae and plankton and stuff like that. And it's a feeding ground and it's the home of a whole bunch of species. So much biodiversity and so much biomass is you know, found in this place. Um, and that biomass is carbon-based. And I, that's an undercommunicated part of this whole climate debate. I think that living habitats like this is a ginormous carbon sink. It captures and you know keeps in the carbon in a ridiculous way. But it is also my backyard, as you said. It's where I and a lot of people like me find solitude. And I'm not sure if I'm that's the correct word, but at least you know peace of mind. So this is me doing what I love to do most, which is you know sitting super still and watching stuff that move about really slowly. And one of them is this one. This is one of my favorite little hermit crabs. Now, nobody's gonna accuse biologists for being inventive, but we are practicals. We like to name stuff for practical reasons. So this is the anemone hermit. And on its back, it's got the hermit's anemone. Um, and this, these two guys are always found together. So if you see here, this anemone has placed its oral side or the, the mouth slash anus part right below the mouth of the hermit crab. Now hermit crabs are messy eaters. So when they eat, they tend to, yeah, the food tends to drizzle down and just let inside the mouth of this anemone. Uh, so it gets free meal and gets carried around. And in return, if the hermit crab is bothered, 
the uh, anemone will poke out all these acanthia, the, the long um, purpley stuff, which is strings with the nematocysts, same thing that you find in, in jellyfish. So it's kind of a protective thing. So this is a good example of mutualistic symbiotic relationship, both benefit from it. And then you have something called commensalism, which is this one where you have, an hermit, you have a hermit crab who carries around a whole bunch of barnacles. Now, the barnacles get a free ride. They get to explore the world or at least the local community. Uh, and they don't really bother or help the hermit crab, but I mean, the hermit crab gets to have barnacles on its back, which is, you know, who wouldn't want to have that? So this is uh, an example where you have somebody who benefits of it, which is the uh, barnacle in this instance, and then you have one who really don't care at all. But these are the big things. One of the good things about putting on a mask is that you can actually go exploring and you can look at things that you wouldn't normally see by just going by it or just driving by. You can go deep into it and you can really explore. And one of the things that you will see when you stop for a minute is this one. I actually spent five minutes staring at the same point before I realized it was a hurt night, a little spider crab once because these guys are masters at camouflaging. And they look like seaweed, which is kind of the point. They're related to these guys, the great spider crabs. And you see, they have really small claws, so they can't really use them to defend themselves. So what they do instead is that they pick up seaweed and other stuff, and they just spit on it. And they have this uh, adhesive thing in their saliva, and they just glue it onto their backs. And they go, what? Can't see me now. I'm invisible. Sort of like the invisible cloak from Harry Potter-ish. Uh, and it's not necessarily just the seaweed. I mean, they can have sponges and even little anemones. Look at this little hat thing that he's put on to just, you know, blend into whatever it is he wants to blend into. Now, I'm not sure if that was this guy's thought. So this is one of the common crabs. This one, I think he just happened to get an anemone on his head, uh, but I think it's <laughs> really nice. It looks like one of the royalties from the British royal house um, but this common short line red crab is one of the commonest things that you will see in the kelp forest these are pretty big and they are the um oh what's the word the janitors of the ocean these guys will eat everything and just help keeping this backyard of ours clean and neat and nice so to prevent that rotting things make it well not cool uh, these are also delicious. So if you go out there, pick these up, especially in the spring night, in the fall, these guys are packed with food and they are really nice, really nutritious. And I mean, getting to go out there and actually pick your own food is one of the best things you want if you want to think about a sustainable future for you know consumption. Uh, another one that is also delicious is this one's the scallop, but not only is it delicious, it is also pretty cool to watch. I mean, all of these scallops have a ton of different animals growing on them. Just from this, you can see two worms all around there. There's barnacles and bryanzoans and chitons, and that's just the stuff that's stuck onto it. In between all these things are also moving uh, animals like this one. Uh, now you can't really eat this one. Well, I mean, you can, but you will probably just eat it once. Um, this is a giant nemertine. It is actually the world's longest animal. So we have the world's longest animal right outside of the shorelines here in Norway. So underneath everybody's docks or in the kelp forest, in between the blue mussels, you will find this thing that can grow up to 60 meters long. Now it looks like chocolate sauce, sort of. Uh, does not taste like chocolate sauce at all. So if you put it in your mouth, say if you are an idiot and you go on a field trip and you put this in your mouth, just to taste if it tastes like chocolate, it, it will tell you that it has a nerve, neurotoxin in its, its uh, skin so that it uh, excretes when it gets irritated. And then your tongue will lose its skull and numb so, And that's not re recommended. Um, of course, I've heard from the person who did that. But I mean, they're really, really, really cool. Uh, so go out there and just say hi to them. I mean, they won't bite. They will just be there. and me. Another thing that looks like food-ish is this one. I think this one looks like sort of like a moldy pancake. 
Uh, and it is one of my favorite things. I've seen these one lay eggs every once in a while and they are gorgeous, pretty big. We call them butter snails. And I mean, prepare for high quality biology humor here. The butter snail is usually found on a sponge that we in Norway call the bread sponge. See, you have, there you have butter on bread. That's what happens to you if you <laughs> start doing biology for too long. <laughs> but this one is really cool. They come in a variety of colors and they usually they get their colors from what they eat. So if they are, uh, so if they live mostly on this sponge, which is yellow, it gets this color. And if it lives mostly on say the pink uh, crustacean algae, it gets pink. So tons of varieties there. And these nudibranchs come in a variety of colors also up here in Norway. So this one is from Norway and this one is also from Norway. So again, this whole big, big, cool um, rainbow spectrum of colors. Now these guys do something called kleptoplastia. So that means that they take something from somebody else and just claim it as their own. This one likes to eat little anemones and hydrozoans and then they keep the nematocysts for themselves and they use it for their own protection, which is kind of cool. And if you Google um, blue sea dragon, you will see one of the meanest bitches out there. This one eats Portuguese man of wars for breakfast and it is so toxic that apparently according to people who touched it, it hurts more to touch the snail than it does to actually touch the Portuguese man of wars. So stay away from them, but go look at them because they're really gorgeous, look like Pokemons. And now one of the reasons that we get all this biodiversity up here is that we're so lucky to have lots and lots of currents. So there's big ocean currents coming in and there's also a lot of nutrients. Like you can see in this picture, lots and lots and lots of nutrients in murky waters. And this is what happens when the currents are at their strongest. Now we, I mean, we have a lot of strong tidal currents up here and when this, all this water gets squeezed in through uh, like really narrow places, you get really visible and noticeable currents. So we have to have the strongest tidal currents in the world up in Saltströmmen. And the biodiversity up there is ridiculous. I mean, it's a mecca for nudibranch hunters and uh, spear fishermen and fishermen and just recreational divers and it is crazy. And one of the, the animals that really benefit from this is the frilled anemone. This is the tallest anemone we have here and grows up to this size. Uh, and they grow in bunches and they're everywhere. And they can take on a lot of different colors, but they're usually around like orangey, pink, purpley-ish, but sometimes you find albinos. And they, they can do sexual reproduction, but they also bud. So that means that they would just squeeze a little part of themselves and place it next to them and say, hey, you know, new me, little mini me. And that's what happened here. You have one big orange one, and one big white one, who just decided to bud off. And now you have this little pompon of cool little anemones hanging out, being happy. And anemones are basically just upside down jellyfish. Now there's actually a species called upside down jellyfish, um, which is, I don't know if it's the original version or if it's just something that happened to just turn off, I don't know. But here we can see a lion's mane jellyfish, biggest plankton in the world, uh, if my sources are correct, and grow up to two meters in diameter in, over the bell. Uh, and it is related to all these anemones. So an anemone, an anemone, is the place where uh, Nemo lives. And so these guys also hurt a little bit, sort of, just the same way as the, um, the, the jellyfish does. And then, I, I mean, I could talk about these guys forever, but I know I have a little bit of short time, so I'm just gonna bump over to one of the things that you can find inside these things, because, I mean, you can look at all these animals, but inside them are also sort of like tiny little ecosystems. And if you look really closely into a lion's mane, you might be happy enough or lucky enough to see one of these. This is the jellyfish parasite. And they are, I mean, this big, they are super cute, big green eyes, look like little aliens, and they feed off of the food that the jellyfish eat. And sometimes if the jellyfish hasn't been, <laughs> been hunting enough, it will just take a bite out of the jellyfish itself. So even our 
enemies have their little parasites and their things. And the last thing I really want to talk about before I round off, let me see, is this one, because this is also a parasite. So this is the common shore crab, not the shore crab is not a parasite, but you see the yellow sac here, which kind of looks like eggs is actually a parasite. It's a barnacle-like thing called the rhizocephala, and it is called the zombie parasite. Now this one infects its host, and then it sort of just packs its whole body around the intestines. And when it's happy about that, it just pulls a lot of springs up to its head and tells the crab, you know, you're pregnant, you're gonna be a mom, send all your food down to me, polish me, make me happy, make sure there's no algae growing on me. And these crabs will happily oblige. And if you look closely, you will even see that this crab is a male. So they even get their male crabs to go about looking forward, becoming moms, which is really nice in a terrifying way. And these are species specific. So there's a ton of different uh, rhizocephala and so forth, a ton of different uh, crustaceans uh, out there. So with that, I hope I didn't scare you away with the last part. So if that one was scary, maybe this one will pull you back in. So put on a mask and a snorkel and maybe a little wetsuit if you are up north because it tends to be a little bit thermodynamically challenging up here. And if you're lucky, maybe this is what will meet you. This little gray seal that is super curious and no, it has not been trained. It's just, I mean, this is a sea puppy and they will come up to you and say hi if they want to. So I hope that was sort of interesting. I hope you learned something. If you're super confused, don't worry. I'm that as well. Um, I could talk for 10 hours straight about all the cool things out here, but I won't. But I hope that I could, you know, so yeah, just saw some seeds, um, maybe trigger a little bit of curiosity. And I hope that everybody who's listening and watching will now go and see, oh my God, I want to learn more about polychaetes or I want to learn more about nudibranchs or seals. So yeah, thank you. Oh, oh my gosh, Pia, don't stop. <laughs> Take us back to the kelp forest. That is incredible. What an amazing place. So different from the kelp forest that I've been in off the coast of California. Uh, just, they look so amazing. Um, that first video you shared as you were slowly moving through. I need that for my screensaver. That's just such a, an amazing view of the kelp forest. So thank you for taking us outside of our homes and into your backyard for a little bit this morning. Thank you for having me. So the first question that came up like immediately is people are wondering if you can tell us about a couple, you know, the names of a couple of those dive sites. Because I think there's some people who would really like to get in oh. there everywhere so as soon as you i mean the oslo fjord this is you know all the good the, the glory of the ocean is that you can basically find the southern kelp forest down in the south as you can up north so just find somewhere that is um semi uh semi exposed then you get the kelp forest because the kelp forest doesn't really like to enclose they need movement um so everywhere from and all the way up north would be my god. So all the way in the inner part of the fjords would probably be a bad idea, but as soon as you get out to the coastline, I mean, go fish. But be careful. I mean, the weather and the, the ocean is ruthless. So make sure you go with some locals that know this place or at least talk to some locals because for all you know, there might be massive tidal current coming in through at that particular point. So yeah. Absolutely. Great advice. And all good divers know you go somewhere new, you go with someone who knows the place. Uh, so great advice, Pia. Absolutely. And those nudies, thanks for sharing us some, some nudie pics. We love to see the nudibranchs. <laughs> uh, that was really cool. And that parasite, uh, the zombie parasite. I mean, our world is amazing. And the biodiversity and the relationships uh, that occur and sometimes in just one spot it's just it just blows the mind absolutely and i'm actually writing a book right now that has the working title answers to quest questions you didn't know you had i'm going to short it down for obvious reasons but the whole point of that book is just to point out all these things that you see you know the biodiversity you can find in one spot just go look at one spot in for an hour and you can be 
counting species for you know ever I, I absolutely I agree 100% most people when they think about diving they think about the big things which are fun and it's great to see a big shark or a seal or and that, that's great but when you get in and you get into the muck and you get down nice and low and look around uh wow the world that you find down there yeah I know and I think that's one of the great things with the kelp forest uh, at least here I mean I know the giant kelp of the coastline of uh, America is and Tanzania, the, the other massive kelp is a little bit deeper, but this one, the, the good thing with this kelp is that you don't have to be a good diver to actually go there. You can just snorkel in the, in the surface and still get to experience really great stuff. And if your dive technique is shit, then you can still just pull down, just, you know, grab hold of a piece of seaweed and just pull yourself down. And these hold fast are so strong that they will keep your weight down easily. So it's for beginners. All right. Gotcha. All right, Pia, you're passionate about the ocean. It shines through your whole talk. Anytime I've ever talked to you. Um, <laughs> when did that, when did that bite you? When did you get the ocean bug? I don't know. I get that question all the time. And I've been told so many times that I don't know, it's not an answer, but I have absolutely no idea. Uh, for as long as I can remember, I've been poking around in the seaweeds at our cabin back home in uh, Sashbud. And I used to love to just lie there for hours, even without any goggles. I'm just staring at shrimps and little seashell crabs and all the, the things that I could see, though a little bit blurry. And my mom and dad would have to pull me up with my lips being all blue and just, I'm not cold. <laughs> uh, so I have no idea when that happened. I think I was just born with it. Or Fair it. enough. I think a lot of people are just drawn to the sea and just don't know why where we came from yeah so. yeah absolutely yeah. um so we um oh, had, a, had a question on deck and this is one that i really wanted to ask you but i've lost it so we're going to go on a different train of thought here and we're going to go back to biodiversity for a minute um typical dive you hit the water um in norway and with it being so cold Right now, people. Oh, there. Questions back. Yes, okay. I wanted to ask this one. This is really important. Um, there's lots of people on the planet, and there's lots of people who die. But compared to the entire planet, it's not a lot. What keeps people from sticking their head in the ocean and getting in? What do you think keeps people from doing that? Because it is such a world. I don't know. Um, in Norway, I think the obvious reason would be thermodynamics. Uh, it is a little bit more challenging to get in the water and stay for hours and hours uh, up here unless you're you know Wim Hof um, so you need a little bit more equipment to do it for a long period of time but um, I don't know I mean I've seen so many different tourist sites where people just put on I mean they have snorkel gear for rental and people get in there so obviously there's something that attracts people but for them to take that full leap into going diving, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the fright, like the, the, the fear of um, messing up. Um, I don't really know. I never really think about anything that I do. So I just kind of, I haven't really thought about why. Just go in and, and yeah, worry about it afterwards. I like Yeah, that. sort of. In, in a responsible way, but I mean, I don't really think about if I want to do something, I don't sit down and think about all the different scenarios where everything can, can go wrong and just, you know, go and think about how much fun it would be. But to now, I mean, the last couple of years in Norway, especially has been seeing a big boom of free divers, especially, but also scuba divers getting certified. So we have full courses. At, well, I mean, up until the Corona, we had full courses every month in just the dive, dive club that I'm in, uh, which would be somewhere between 15 and 20 new divers every month. So, I mean, it's getting there. We just need to show people. I think it's easier to just go in your backyard and look at a tree than it is to go down and, you know, look at some seaweed and say, hey, let's just take a little cozy little walk into the kelp forest. Yeah. So uh, I think we'll wrap up with this one last question today. Everything we saw looked so beautiful and so pristine, but obviously that's probably not the case everywhere. What are a couple of the threats facing uh, these forests off the coast of Norway? Well, um, 
climate change is one thing. So I don't know if you noticed, but in the the video with a lot of currents, there was a lot of these um, thread-like sort of slimy algae, and they are now with they thrive in warmer waters. So with warmer waters, they come up here and they are just covering all the seaweed, the eelgrass, and all the kelp, and sort of smushing them, smothering them. So they they won't get enough sunlight. They don't get enough oxygen. Uh, you have sea urchins. They will eat everything. So from the north, you have the uh, Kamchatka crabs coming in, and then you have the sea, uh, sea urchins coming in from the south. And then you have, uh, well, <laughs> we, we do harvest a lot of seaweed, but I'm not sure if we harvest enough to make a difference. There have been some talk about us, you know, since we harvest so much from one spot that this spot doesn't really have time to regenerate before uh, things go back to being really bad. But other than that, hopefully, or thankfully for now, the kelp forests up here are actually growing back. So they're increasing in size every year. So that's kind of a good thing. So there have been a lot of, especially to get away the, uh, the sea urchins has been done a lot of really, um, I forget the word, but yeah, a lot of things being done. All right. Well, Pia, thank you so much for taking us uh, into your world. It's absolutely incredible. We barely scratched the surface. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Tons of fun. Uh, and thanks for joining us on day three of the Global Biodiversity Festival. Thanks for having me and good luck with it. Thank you very much. We'll catch you later.